mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never fails. Our helper, he amid the Seek to work us woe, his craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. And on earth is not his equal. Hey, what's up everybody? Well, welcome back to Walking Through the Word. I'm Josiah Spinoza. Today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 6, verse 15 to 23. So if you have your Bibles, open them with me as we walk through the Word together. Uh, last time we actually saw Paul, we read about Paul um, in his letters to the Roman in chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Um, in those verses, he talks about our deadness to sin and our renewed life in Christ. And so we're going to continue our study now in verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Now, Paul is not one to say that there is nothing good in the law. Um, if anything, Paul recognizes that the law is good because it reflects the holiness of God. It reflects the expectations of God toward a holy people. Now, now that we are in the new covenant of grace, uh, we also recognize that Christ completed the law, that Christ completed the works of the law for us. And so uh, when we come to Christ in faith, um, we live in accordance uh, to the moral character of the law, not by the letter of the law, as he would say, but to the moral character of the law, uh, because we live by faith through the spirit and the spirit writes the law of God on our hearts. And so we live in accordance to our faith and we live in accordance to the morality of the law. And so when we talk about um, holiness, when we talked about grace, um, we recognize that our uh, position in Christ is what makes us holy. And um, that no matter what our sins are, even after we're saved, our sins are forgiven. But just like it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, are we to continue to sin so that grace may abound? Of course not. So Paul continues his line of thinking here. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? And of course, um, he wants to say by no means. Of course not. Um, the reason we don't sin is not because grace um, covers any and all kinds of lifestyles. Remember last time we talked about we are new creatures in Christ, our new natures in Christ are dead to sin and alive to the newness of life in Jesus Christ. And so uh, we're not condemned under the law. We are forgiven under grace. But are we to continue to sin just because we're not under the law anymore, but under grace and therefore we can live however, however we want? Um, no, because there are those who, who say that we can live however we wish. That it doesn't matter the kind of lifestyle that you live. You don't have to change your life. It's a cheap grace understanding. Um, there are those who believe in a word called anti nomianism. I know it's a long word. But anti meaning against. And nomianism is the Greek word namas. Uh, we don't, um, we are not, I am not an antinomian. And if you are a Christian, then you shouldn't be an antinomian e either. Um, nomian or namas means law. So we're not against the law. We just recognize that in Christ, the law is completed and the law is written in our hearts. And we live out the moral character of the law and not the works of the letter of the law, not the written code but the code that's written in our hearts. And so in verse 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, 
either of sin, so before Christ, we are slaves of sin. Um, we cannot help but do anything but sin because we are mastered by our sin. And even when it seems like people do good things in the sight of God, those things are filthy rags. Um, they are not good in the sight of God, even though it may seem good to human appearance. Uh, for, for God, it's about the heart. And if you are not in Christ, if you have not received the grace of God, if you have not been justified through faith in Jesus, then even the good that you do is sinful in the eyes of God because it's not done to the glory of God and it's not done in faith. So you're slaves of sin, which leads to death. So that, again, we're talking about natures, light versus dark, evil versus good, holy versus unholy, righteous versus unrighteous. We're talking about two completely different lifestyles, two completely different natures. You were once slaves uh, which when you were obedient to sin uh, it led to death or um, again the other side of this is obedience which leads to righteousness so um, whatever you present your members to whatever you present yourself to as an obedient slave to that thing is what you obey so if you're a slave of sin, you obey your sin. And if you obey your sin, then it leads to death. But if you're a slave of Christ and you are obedient to Christ, well, it leads to righteousness. It leads to a life of holiness, goodness, wholeness. Um, that is the nature of the Christian now that we are in Christ. Uh, he says, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin so you this is all of us every single uh, person who lives on this earth even those who have come to christ even if you grew up knowing about christ you were once slaves of sin now i know that there are those who came to um, to the obedience of the faith at a very very young age some some have confessed that they have followed the Lord since they were six or seven years old. And that is such a wonderful, um, a wonderful testimony. But even before that, you were a slave of sin. You were obedient to the slave of your sin. And so you who were once slaves of sin, because that's not who we are in Christ anymore. We are now alive in Christ. We are renewed in Christ. We were once slaves of sin and we have become obedient. This is who we are now in our new nature with Christ. Obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And of course, that standard of teaching is Christ. The gospel, the, the, the moral of the, the morality of the law and not the written works of the law. Um, the reason that we... Um, are free in Christ is because Christ has set us free and we are obedient to the standard of teaching to which we were committed in the gospel in the New Testament of Jesus Christ and he says and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness now you might think well if we were slaves of sin we usually think being a slave of something has a negative connotation tied to it. And um, the reality is, if you're a slave of sin, that is a negative thing. That is a bad thing because you cannot help but be a slave to the thing in which you are mastered to. It, took, it had control of your heart. It had control of your will. It had control of your emotions. Everything that was true about who you were in your sin that was obedient to that sin but Christ set us free from sin we are no longer bound by the chains of our old nature and he has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his son and so therefore we have become slaves of righteousness now again it's a freeing thing to be a slave of God, to be a slave to righteousness. 
Um, when we think of Adam and Eve, when Adam was in the garden before the fall, he was a slave to obedience of God. And it wasn't until the temptation of the serpent and his own heart turned against God, and he became a slave of sin. But Adam was more free before the fall. And so when we come to Christ, we are free, free from our old sinful habits, free from our sinful nature, free from our lusts, free from our um, evil and uh, malicious desires and passions. And so we become slaves to righteousness. We continue now. In verse 19, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. Now, you have to understand something about Paul. He's not trying to um, make the readers of this letter feel like they are intellectually inferior. Uh, we do recognize that Paul says some very lofty things. Even Peter confesses that some of the things that Paul writes are difficult to understand. Even for Peter, the things that Paul wrote, the things that Paul said were difficult to understand. Um, and so P when Paul is writing, he's, he's trying to speak to them in normal human language in ways that they could understand. The Roman people would know, the people of that time would know exactly what it meant to be a slave. It meant to be mastered by something. And so Paul uses human language, human cultural uh, things to help them to better understand what it is he's trying to say. So he continues on. For just as you were once present, as you once presented your members, and this is of course your body, your hands, your feet, your mouth, your mind, your heart, everything that is uh, part of you, you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. That's who you used to be. That's who I used to be. We were mastered by our sins. But that's not who we are in Christ anymore. Remember, Christ, and here in uh, verse 18, Christ has set us free. We are free in Christ. And so even though that's what we used to do, we once presented our members, that means that we are not presently presenting our members to slave as a slave to impurity or lawlessness he says so now like it's a it's a transition there has been a transformation in your heart and so because of that transformation in your heart you do things differently outwardly as well so he says so now present your members that's your body your mouth your heart your mind um, your hands your feet everything present your members as slaves to righteousness and when we do this when we present our members to god as slave to righteousness when we are mastered by the spirit when we are mastered by christ and when we are mastered by the father when god has taken hold of our hearts we then live in accordance to his word according to his um, commands we live in accordance to his um, expectation of holiness. And it leads to sanctification. Now, this is such an important term. Sanctification means to make holy or to set apart. Um, every believer, true believer, born again believer, is undergoing the process of sanctification. And that's why we have this constant battle taking place in our lives because there there's two realities that are at war with one another when we present our members as obedient slaves to god and that is that our old nature which is truly t crucified and truly dead um we are at war with our old nature we are daily trying to crucify him um, in the way that we uh, speak to others or in the way that we talk about others or in the way that we um, covet things or what whatever it is that we struggle with any doubts any fears any temptations that's the war that's going on within us that is the sanctification process by which we are undergoing it never stops brothers and sisters you can never reach absolute 
um, perfection in this life because this life is full of trials and tribulations and difficulties and sufferings and there's going to be times where we fear and we doubt but that's because we're undergoing sanctification we haven't yet been perfectly glorified with christ yet but just know brothers and sisters that if you have experienced the grace of god those things that come against us those difficulties those fears those doubts they do not separate us from the love of god we are new creatures in christ and you can be rest assured that if you are indeed in the hands of christ he would never let you go in uh, john chapter 6 verse 37 jesus says all that the father gives to me will come to me and the one who comes to me i will never cast out jesus never stops working in us he is the perfect savior he jesus would never start something in us and then in the middle just let it go and just say you know what no i'm, I'm done with you that would never happen with christ because christ is a perfect savior verse 20 for when you were slaves of sin again you were slaves this is who you used to be when you were slaves of sin you were free in regard to righteousness now that doesn't mean that god didn't expect repentance and faith god commands all men everywhere to repent and believe on the lord jesus christ what he's saying here is god did not expect you to live righteously because you could not you were a slave of sin and so as a slave of sin you were mastered by that sin and you were not mastered by righteousness so there was no expectation of you to be mastered by righteousness you know i always see uh, i always hear of, of those who claim to be christians and yet they live a double life and and they claim christ and they say they go to church and they say they they get involved in christian things but on the weekends or on friday nights and saturday nights they're living a life uh, that even the devil would be proud of and this double lifestyle makes me th think well you're a slave of sin still you're mastered by your sin why don't you just live how you want to live because you're free in regard to righteousness you're just you're making yourself think that God is okay with you just because you claim to be of Christ. But it's obvious that you're a slave of sin. Now, of course, I would never tell a Christian, a true born again Christian, just go live however you want because you're covered by grace. That's how Paul started this, this whole chapter. But for the unbeliever, there is no expectation in regards to righteousness. They're free in regard to righteousness. But look at what Paul says. He says, but what fruit? What fruit were you getting at at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed of? Of course, wh when he says you, he's not talking about those people who are unbelieving. He's talking about the true born again believer. Because the believer when he looks back at his former life, he's not proud of the life that he used to live. Yes, he recognizes, yeah, when I was a sinful person, I just did what I wanted to do, and I didn't really think about living in righteousness. But what fruit, what was that, um, that, what was the goodness that came out of that lifestyle? What was the fruit in all that? What were you bearing? What were you showing? What was your life manifesting? drunkenness pornography sexual impurities um a foul mouth a foul heart what what was that fruit and i always i always say this in a in a kind of um sarcastic manner but when we talk about fruit i always say you'll never see someone who's completely high on drugs or completely drunk on alcohol doing good things for the lord because that's not the kind of fruit that one bears when they are slaves of sin so you i mean when i look back there are things that um, bring memories and my old sin nature says 
man, you remember those good times? But my spirit in me is like, no, you were lost. How can you enjoy those things? How can you even enjoy those memories? Don't you remember the late nights and the headaches and the and all the the suffering that came about because of your sin? Because that fruit was not good fruit. And I was ashamed of it. He says, for the end, the end of those things is death. The one who lives in their sin, the one who is a slave of their sin, the one who is bearing fruit that leads to damnation and destruction in hell, those things end in death. And to finish off, verses 22 through 23. But now, that's us. Now, because that's who you used to be. You used to be a slave of your sin, but now... That you have been set free from sin and then become slaves of God. Because there's true freedom found being a slave of God. When you are mastered by God, there is absolute freedom in that. He makes the contrast now here. The fruit, because we do bear fruit, we do good works because of Christ in us. We do good works because of the Spirit of God within us. We bear the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 talks about that. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against those things there is no law. So we do bear the fruit of the Spirit. And it leads to sanctification. Again, we are undergoing the process of becoming more and more holy, greater and greater degrees of glory, greater and greater de degrees of grace. And its end, because just as the other end was damnation and death, its end is eternal life. And that's why salvation, when we talk about salvation... Salvation is not just a one-time act of belief and justification. Salvation is the ongoing process which goes on to glorification. Glorification is the end when we are finally with Christ. Running out of space. When we're finally with Christ, but from the time that we are saved to the time that we are glorified, we are undergoing the process of sanctification. And the more that we are sanctified, the more we're going to bear fruit that leads to more sanctification. It's a wonderful cycle that we are going through. It's a wonderful um, thing to be in the grace of God because the more that we are in the grace of God, the more that we're going to bear fruit, the more we bear fruit, the more we're going to be sanctified. And the more we sanctified, it bears and manifests the reality that we will inherit eternal life. Our whole life should re revolve around the reality that we are in Christ and everything what we do should testify to the fact that we will inherit eternal life with Christ verse 23 for the wages of sin is death when you think about wages you think okay if I work a certain amount of hours my wages is what is owed me well if you are a slave of sin then what you are owed is death because the fruit that comes from a sinful nature is death those are your wages that's what you rightly deserve and the difference is of course when it comes to eternal life you don't deserve it it's not yours to say I've worked for it and now my wages are eternal life because it says in verse 23, but the free gift of God. This is, this is the message of the gospel. This is why it makes people think, well, you can just sin because grace is going to abound. This is the reality of the gospel. 
If at the end of understanding the gospel, all you feel is the weight of the glory of Jesus Christ and his power to forgive you, even though you are a sinful person, even though I am a sinful person, I realize, man, the grace of God is so powerful that no matter what I do, the grace of God will suffice in covering my sins. And that's why Paul has to start off this chapter like, will we continue to sin so that grace may abound? No, of course not. That's not who we are anymore in Christ. But nonetheless, it is a free gift. And we should never take that free gift for granted. Because the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a wonderful message. I love Romans chapter 6. Out of all the chapters in Romans, 6 has to be one of my favorite chapters. Um, and I hope and I pray that as we continue our study through the book of Romans, that you continue to increase in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you understand your position in Christ as being saved, as being justified, as having received eternal life, as undergoing the process of sanctification, because that's all part of the gospel. That's all part of your salvation. I pray that the Lord um, will continue to manifest his glory to you through this book. So please join me next time. We're going to be continue studying through Romans. We're going to start in Romans chapter 7, verse 1, and we're actually going to get into um, the whole uh, idea that the law is now done away with because of the gift of grace in Jesus Christ. So I hope you can join me next time on walking through the word. God bless you guys.